Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn-Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. I want to give a special thank you to the Queen Anne Book Company for their partnership on today's program. There is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the story, wrote Frank Herbert, an award-winning science fiction author. When this is over, we've all probably said this phrase recently, I've heard myself say, when we are on the other side of this, as if there's a defined finished line, we like clean timelines, endings that are securely buttoned up, but endings are fuzzy and often gradual and full of blur. Endings occur in phases. When we talk about the Holocaust, we often talk about it as if the story ends in 1945 with the liberation of the camps. Pictures and movies frequently portray jubilant survivors and then the curtains close. But for so many, the Holocaust didn't end in 1945. There were continued pogroms in Poland, thousands of Jewish people in displaced persons camps waiting for entry to new countries, countless people looking for loved ones, and survivors for whom the Holocaust would never end. For one group of survivors, the end depended on bringing notorious SS Nazi criminal Adolf Eichmann to justice. 15 years after the liberation of the camps, and exactly 60 years ago yesterday, on May 11th, 1960, their tenacity and sheer grit led to Eichmann's capture in Buenos Aires. The story of finding Eichmann and bringing him to justice was a web of secrets and chances. Investigative journalist and author Neil Bascom conducted hours of interviews, seeking out witnesses, relatives, and even those involved to untangle the unbelievable story of the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann's highly publicized trial in Israel reminded the world that the Holocaust had not simply ended in 1945. The world had a responsibility to continue to seek justice and to teach others in the hopes that this wouldn't happen again. The Holocaust Center for Humanity remains dedicated to teaching the lessons of the Holocaust. Teaching and learning about the Holocaust is more than a history lesson. It is through the study of the Holocaust that we learn about the importance of standing up for one another, the dangers of stereotyping and scapegoating, and the difference one person's actions make. If you are able, help us to continue offering programs like this one with a small donation. You can make a gift on our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. Just click on the donate button in the upper right corner of the homepage. Donations of all sizes are appreciated. Thank you. I'm so pleased to have with us today, award-winning and New York Times best-selling author, Neil Bascom, author of Hunting Eichmann and the young adult version, Nazi Hunters, and many other books, including his newest, Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress and Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best, which I just purchased yesterday through our partner, the Queen Anne Book Company. Until recently, Neil lived in Seattle. He now re resides in Philadelphia, but is joining us today from Charleston. Neil will answer questions at the end of this program. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions at any time. Thank you so much, Neil, for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. And Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and welcoming me into your uh, living rooms as it were. Uh, I'm excited to speak to you about uh, Hunting Eichmann and the search uh, for Adolf Eichmann. Now, when I first started this book um, and first began investigating it, I often asked myself the question, you know, um, will I, is, is this a story that I wanna write? Because I've written on everything from uh, skyscraper wars in New York in 1929 to Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile uh, to high school kids building robots. And there are just a range of books and, and, and interests. Uh, but I always ask myself two essential questions before I start a project. First is, um, do I have something new to offer to this story or this history? And in the case for the hunt of, of Adolf Eichmann, uh, prior uh, to my book, there the operation and the narrative behind that was largely based on a one-sided view from, from the Mossad agents or otherwise just sort of wrapped in myth. 
Uh, everything, according to the Mossad, went swimmingly. Nothing went wrong. They went down to Argentina to get him. Uh, they were very quick about it. They had him back in Israel uh, before anyone knew. And that couldn't have been further from the case. So from the point of view of being able to interview the Mossad agents, uh, the people from El Al, and many others, I feel like I had a chance to really bring something new to this story. Uh, the second question I ask myself is, does this story have something important to say? And I would, I would argue that of, of all my books, um, this one has the most important thing to say about memory and about justice and the importance of both. I first came to this story actually in, uh, in college. Uh, I was working or studying in Luxembourg, uh, economics and, and German. And I, for extra money, would walk the dogs of, of people in the neighborhood in which I lived. And one of my clients uh, had this small yippy little dog uh, who was really terrible. Uh, but after walking the dog, I would always uh, go in and have some tea with her. And it turned out that she was a Holocaust survivor. And she told me after many of these teas that she was never able to openly speak about what happened to her uh, during the war until after Adolf Eichmann uh, was captured and put on trial. And that story and that importance of, of, of what his trial did to our understanding of the Holocaust um, wrapped up with this exciting kind of spy narrative was something that I'd always wanted to pursue. And that's why almost a dozen years ago, uh, I started writing uh, Hunting Eichmann. Now I'd like to um, begin sharing my screen here because I have a slide presentation. Uh, if I was in person with you, I would have it and be pointing to it, but I will be doing it uh, remotely. Um, and I'll begin that now. One second, please. Okay. So when I first began this, I thought that the story that I would write uh, would largely focus on uh, the hunters themselves and, and that Eichmann, many people had written biographies of him, kind of understood what his role was and that there was really no need to sort of rehash that. But the more I investigated this, the more I researched who Adolf Eichmann was, the more kind of incensed I became because my understanding of what I was taught uh, about who Adolf Eichmann was, was very different from the individual uh, that I learned through my own uh, research. According to Hannah Arendt, which was what most people consider their sort of understanding of Eichmann, he was simply a cog in the wheel of the massive German Reich uh, and that he had no particular bent against the Jews. He was just doing his job and was sort of raised into that. And that couldn't have been further from the case. In fact, when Eichmann joined the SS and then found himself, uh, or actually positioned himself uh, to be in charge of uh, the Jewish population, uh, he went to Austria after the annexation in 1938. And he wrote back a friend and wrote, they are finally in my hands. That's what Adolf Eichmann thought of the Jews. He thought that he was this all powerful force. Uh, he was, became sort of uh, almost soiled and, and um, ruined by this, the power corrupts and power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. absolutely. And so over the years, Eichmann became, in essence, the operational master of the Holocaust. And probably what he considered his, he stated this, uh, what his masterwork was, was his time in Hungary. He went into Hungary. Uh, there were roughly 800,000 Jews living within the country in 1944. Within the span of roughly four months, he had eliminated 450,000 Jews in Hungary. He considered it his masterwork. And even when the war was largely up and the allies were coming in from every side, uh, Eichmann continued to, um, to send Jews to the concentration camps and the extermination camps. He actually had to be stopped by Heinrich Himmler who wanted to use the Jewish population as bargaining chips. And so when you have Heinrich Himmler holding you back, you get, get a better understanding of who Adolf Eichmann actually was. I'd like you to just take a look um, at this image of, of Eichmann when he was really at the height of his power, uh, the sort of symbolism here, the look of his face, because you will find later in this presentation how dramatically different he looked once he went into hiding. <clears throat> so what happens to Eichmann? The war is over, um, he goes into hiding. He goes uh, to Northern Germany, 
uh, stays there for a number of months and then makes his way down through Germany, uh, through Austria and Switzerland into Italy and finally to Argentina. He is helped along the way uh, by members of the Catholic Church and he is helped by the government of Juan Perón uh, in Argentina. Juan Perón said probably one of his more famous quotes was that the Nuremberg trials were the worst atrocity of justice in history. That's who Juan Perón was. And he wanted to bring in members uh, of the Third Reich for many reasons. Uh, SS members to help with his security services, uh, scientists, doctors, um, industrialists, all to sort of bring uh, Argentina forward. And so he didn't care what uh, people had done in the past, uh, what crimes they committed. He helped orchestrate these rat lines that Adolf Eichmann took eventually to arrive in Argentina in 1950. And this is actually the Red Cross passport that Eichmann used uh, to get there. As you can see here, if you sort of turn your head, uh, his alias was Ricardo Clement. They provided, the Argentinian government provided him with a new identity, uh, with job, with money, with a place to live, uh, everything he would need uh, to restart his life. This is actually a portrait of, of Eichmann uh, uh, boarding uh, the ship to Argentina. And so his first job actually when he arrives is far away from Buenos Aires, living in the, the Pampas, uh, working as a uh, dam engineer, uh, even though he had absolutely no experience uh, in the matter. And so by largely by 1952, uh, Eichmann is essentially free uh, and no one is looking for him. So that is the story, first of all, of how Eichmann gets uh, to Argentina. And I'd like to sort of turn back now to the story of the hunters themselves. Uh, the image you have here, the portrait you have here is of Simon Wiesenthal. Now Simon Wiesenthal, as we know him uh, now, is this sort of famous Nazi hunter, this large presence. But imagine uh, Simon in 1945, a former architect, had been in concentration camps for years, uh, weighed only 95 pounds when he came out of the camps and he was a large guy. He was about six, over six feet tall. Uh, no criminal investigative experience, uh, no detective work experience, but he had a very keen memory and he was very dedicated to going after the guards and the camp uh, superintendents uh, who had committed so many crimes against the Jewish people. And one of the first names that he is, is aroused to is Adolf Eichmann. Now, what you have to understand is that Adolf really tried to fly under the radar uh, over the course of the war. I mean, he was only, his title was a lieutenant colonel, or his rank was lieutenant colonel, which was not a very uh, prestigious uh, rank given how much power he actually had. Adolf Eichmann was very careful about not having his photograph taken about not appearing uh, in large gatherings. He was very worried about his security. And so even at the Nuremberg trials, uh, people largely didn't know who he was. In fact, the judge wrote in his uh, margins when Adolf Eichmann's name was first uh, presented, who is Adolf Eichmann? So people didn't know. And so Simon was tipped off to this individual. Uh, he began to do some very important things uh, very soon after the war. The first thing he did was collect evidence about what Adolf Eichmann did over the course of the war, the crimes he committed. Uh, the second thing he did was he proved that Adolf Eichmann was not dead. Adolf, uh, through his family, had tried to convince the authorities that he had been killed on the Eastern Front. And of course, you do not search for a dead man. Uh, Simon discovered uh, that all the affidavits uh, declaring uh, Adolf Eichmann dead were false. And so now he had a firm idea uh, that he was on the run. And the third and probably the most important thing he did was he discovered a little uh, scene photograph of Eichmann that was taken during the war uh, by Eichmann's mistress. And so Simon with a Romeo agent um, wooed this uh, former mistress, got a photograph of Eichmann and really it was the first time people knew what he looked like and then that was in the future, as I'll, as I'll talk later, very important to the, ultimately to the capture. Really the only other um, Nazi hunter at this time soon after the war 
uh, was uh, Tuvai Friedman. He was sort of a partner uh, in arms uh, with Simon. But even by 1950, 1951, 52, uh, Tuvaya and Simon have largely given up uh, the pursuit of war criminals. Uh, the world wants to move on. Germany wants to move on. Uh, the, com the threat of communism becomes uh, the most important thing. And the pursuit of these war criminals is really last on the list. So over the course of most of the 1950s, Eichmann is free in Argentina. Uh, he starts as a dam engineer, as, as I noted, but then largely finds himself, um, first of all, devolving as a human individual, uh, drinking a lot, smoking a lot, sort of obsessed with the past. Uh, he became a pariah within uh, the German community. He was um, went from being a dam engineer to a rabbit farmer, uh, to running a failed dry cleaning business, to ultimately by the late 1950s, uh, working on the line of a Mercedes-Benz uh, truck assembly plant. Next critical person over the course of the story, and what I love about um, this, um, this narrative and this history is that it really is about ordinary people doing uh, rather extraordinary things to help bring uh, Eichmann to justice. And the two individuals uh, seen here uh, on the left or I'm not sure if it's on your left, uh, Sylvia Herman, uh, a young woman in 17 years old and her father, Lothar Herman. Sylvia found herself in 1957 uh, dating uh, this individual named Nicholas Eichmann. Now you have to understand that the Eichmann name even at that point was very little known um, to the world community. So, so the name Eichmann would not have raised any um, warning signs uh, to, to Sylvia. Uh, who was Jewish uh, or her father. So Sylvia is dating uh, Nicholas. She invites him over uh, to dinner as, uh, as couples do. And Nicholas is at the dinner with Sylvia and says during the course of eating, it's too bad the Germans didn't finish off the Jews during the war. Now you can imagine uh, what the impact of that statement said, uh, had on Lothar Herman, who was imprisoned in Dachau uh, in the mid-1930s, uh, was blinded by the Germans, ultimately escaped to Argentina, and largely hid his Jewish heritage uh, to anyone within the community. So Nicholas wouldn't have known that he was Jewish. Uh, Sylvia uh, did not uh, tell people uh, that. So he felt that this would be polite dinner conversation, I uh, guess, at the Herman House. But of course, you can imagine what their uh, reaction response was uh, soon afterwards. Um, uh, Sylvia and Nicholas broke up, and that was really the end of things. Until roughly 1958. In 1958, uh, this individual here, uh, Dr. Fritz Bauer, who was a West German uh, prosecutor of the state of Hesse, and he was really the only one within the German West German justice system who wanted to pursue uh, these war criminals. And so in 1958, he publishes a list of the top 10 war criminals that should be pursued and brought to justice and tried. And on that list was the name Adolf Eichmann. Now, Sylvia would read uh, the paper to her father uh, in the German newspaper every week. And they were reading this article about Dr. Fritz Bauer and his declarations and the name Adolf Eichmann came up. And they both, uh, Sylvia and Lothar, were intrigued with the thought uh, that Nicholas Eichmann could somehow be, re be related to Adolf Eichmann. Now you have to understand that it was widely known that many Germans uh, had come to Argentina uh, after the war. Uh, Sylvia was always a bit suspicious because Nicholas would never invite him of her over to her house. Uh, he had stated at one point that his father was a high ranking uh, German army officer uh, who traveled along a, a lot during the war. And so they had this suspicion. <clears throat> so what did they do? They end up writing this letter uh, to Dr. Fritz Bauer uh, saying that they believe um, that uh, Adolf Eichmann uh, may be living uh, in Buenos Aires. And of course, their feeling, Lothar and Sylvia, is, is they're gonna con convey this information and they're gonna wipe their hands of it and uh, it's someone else's uh, issue, someone else's problem. But Dr. Fritz Bauer has his own issues. 
nobody wants to help him. Uh, the West German government is overwhelmed with former uh, Nazi officials. Uh, he goes to Interpol. Interpol says we will not help. Uh, he goes to the United States uh, with his suspicions that Eichmann is living uh, in Argentina. Uh, they sort of wipe their hands of it as well and says we are not in the business of apprehending war criminals. So what Fritz Bauer is left with is writing a letter back uh, to Sylvia and Lothar saying essentially find proof that Adolf Eichmann is actually there. Here is a photograph of what he looked like. They used the photograph that Simon Wiesenthal uh, had found uh, in 1946. And Fritz Bauer explains uh, what he looks like, uh, what he sounds like, the sort of impression he gives, sends this note to Sylvia and Lothar who have now moved outside of Buenos Aires and says, and says essentially, go find uh, one of the worst war criminals in history. And what's incredible uh, is they actually do it. Uh, they take an overnight train into Buenos Aires. Sylvia uh, begins asking around, finding friends who knows Nicholas, where he lives. And eventually she goes to his house, um, as she said at one point in a pretty uh, dress. Her father's sort of on the corner, but he's not gonna be much help. Uh, there's no police backup, nothing. She goes and knocks on the door uh, and who answers uh, but this individual named Ricardo Clement. Uh, Ricardo says that he is the uncle of Nicholas. He invites her in. Uh, but again, what you have to understand is that, as you'll see later in the presentation, is that Adolf Eichmann looked very different um, in 1958 than he did uh, back in the war. So his line, his face was lined. He was sort of sagging. Um, he just looked dramatically different. And so Sylvia is unsure if this is actually the man. She can't really tell from from the way he talks or the way he looks. Uh, she eventually asks him, uh, you know, what the relation is. Ricardo says, I'm Nicholas's uncle. And really that's how it would have ended except for Nicholas Eichmann comes in. And you can imagine your ex-girlfriend um, suddenly showing up at your house when you know your father uh, is a war criminal. And uh, he ushers her out uh, rather quickly, grabs her by the arm and takes her out of, of the house. But he says, um, rather unwisely, I will be right back, father. And that was really the point where Sylvia and Lothar uh, knew fundamentally uh, that this uh, was Adolf Eichmann and they conveyed this information back to uh, Fritz Bauer. Uh, Fritz Bauer decides ultimately that if Interpol won't do anything, if the Americans won't do anything, if his own government won't do anything, he will take this information to the one country uh, that may be most interested. He goes to the Israelis. And he goes to, and this information finds its way uh, to this individual here, uh, Isser Harel. Now, Isser Harel at the time was the head of, of Shin Bet and the Mossad, which is similar to being the head of, of the FBI and the CIA simultaneously. He was a very powerful individual within the Israeli government. But his role largely was to secure the state of Israel from its neighbors. And pursuing war criminals was not in his job prospectus, and he wasn't really interested in doing anything about it. And I'll wait on that. So what happens? So Israel uh, has this information, feels compelled to do something with it. So he sends uh, a police investigator named Ephraim Hofstetter, who was a very able police investigator, but he spoke no Spanish, uh, he had never been to Argentina, and he finds himself in Buenos Aires looking around uh, and going to the address where Sylvia uh, had gone uh, and discovered Ricardo Clement, aka um, Adolf Eichmann. Ephraim Hofstadter looks at this, um, goes to the neighborhood, sees this uh, small, rather decrepit house on the outskirts of Buenos Aires, and, and takes a look at it and says, and he even cables back to Israel. There's no way that Adolf Eichmann could live in quote unquote, such a wretched little house. Now the image that the Israelis had, like many people had of Adolf Eichmann was again, this uh, powerful figure, this uh, wealthy figure uh, who would never have sort of um, found himself in such a situation that he's living in this tiny house. So, they, so the Israelis uh, get this information, Israel gets this information, 
and basically closes the investigation and that's it. Now a year passes uh, and another uh, tip comes in to Dr. Fritz Bauer. And I know now that this tip eventually came through the West German uh, intelligence service, but the tip came uh, from Argentina and it had the information almost exactly syncs with what Sylvia had found, where Eichmann uh, lived, uh, what job he had, how and when he arrived in Argentina, uh, what jobs he had uh, experienced uh, over that time. Really everything you would need to know to, to find him uh, and, and capture him. And this synced with Sylvia's information. So Fritz Bauer uh, memorizes this information, hops on a plane this time, goes to Israel and conveys this information to Isser Harrell and basically throws a bit of a tantrum saying, here is Adolf Eichmann. Uh, we know where he lives. You have to go and find him. Too much time has passed. Isser Harrell now is pretty firmly convinced uh, that this is the man, that he knows his location. And what he wants to do uh, rather pragmatically uh, is just send a few Mossad agents down to Argentina and have him killed to assassinate him, to uh, arrange him to be shot in the dark alley, uh, to orchestrate a car crash, something, but just to rid humanity of Adolf Eichmann. Someone else has a very different idea of what to do though. This information is brought to the head of the Israeli government, David Ben-Gurion, and David Ben-Gurion decides that this is an opportunity uh, not to be wasted on revenge. He decides that he wants Eichmann captured and brought back to Israel and put on trial. And that trial, as, as, as Ben-Gurion said, fundamentally, uh, even before the operation took place, will do two things. The first thing it will do was to remind the world uh, what had happened to the Jews uh, by the Germans, uh, to remind them of the Holocaust and all the horrors of that. And the second thing was to remind the Israeli youth why the state of Israel needed to exist. And so by orchestrating this operation and bringing him back for trial, they will accomplish these two things. So by now, by 1959, uh, a year and a half has passed roughly from when Sylvia first gave this information. And Issa Harrell sends this individual, Zviya Haroni, uh, who was a Shin Bet uh, police interrogator or Shin Bet interrogator uh, who spoke Spanish uh, down to Buenos Aires to confirm his location, to confirm Eiffel's location when a team would be sent. Well, what Zviya Haroni discovers uh, soon after arriving in the capital is that Adolf Eichmann has left uh, that house uh, in Los Olivos uh, where Sylvia had gone and had left, had been very uh, careful about revealing where he had gone. And so now they not only need to capture, detain and bring Eichmann back uh, to Israel, but they need to find him again. And what's incredible is that Zvi Aharoni pursues this investigation um, incredibly well um, eventually discovers where Eichmann lives, uh, hides in the back of this truck you see here to survey uh, the property uh, where Eichmann lived on, on Garibaldi Street, even further, almost in the exurbs of, of Buenos Aires. And ultimately, they need to know with 100% certainty that this is their man. They can't send a, a mission down there unless they know um, absolutely that this is Adolf Eichmann. So in fact, what happens is Zvi Aroni hides a camera within a briefcase, uh, approaches the house on Garibaldi Street, approaches Adolf Eichmann, uh, ostensibly looking for uh, real estate and snaps this photograph of Adolf Eichmann uh, outside his yard uh, on, in Garibaldi Street. And they ultimately ended up identifying him uh, by his ears, uh, remarkably. Your ears are very similar to your fingerprint in that they are uh, unique to an individual, the whorls of them, the size, the shape. And so this actual photograph was sent back to Israel, uh, analyzed by forensic scientists, uh, determined that this uh, ear configuration matched the one uh, from the photograph that Simon Wiesenthal had found and that they for certain had their man. And so now begins this operation uh, to, to go down to, to Argentina and have Eichmann captured. And they assemble what is almost like a spy movie. 
Um, these individuals, you, know, you have an operational uh, organizer, you have the strongman, uh, you have a forger, you have a doctor, um, you have the top individuals within the Shinbat and the Mossad. You have the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten top uh, agents, including Isser Harrell himself. Uh, really, if you can imagine, the head of the CIA himself going uh, to uh, a state uh, to lead an operation. But that's what you have with this young, fledgling uh, Mossad agency, which really was still um, finding its footing uh, even by 1960. They survey uh, the House um, over the course of weeks. Uh, they follow Eichmann, even sometimes riding the same bus that he took uh, to the Mercedes automobile plant. Um, they plan the operation uh, meticulously. They set up several safe houses. They have cars uh, assembled. Many of these uh, items, the cars, the safe houses, provided by um, individuals uh, of the Jewish faith who lived in Argentina, uh, who were not told why they needed it, but um, they were asked for their help and they provided it. This is a closer shot of, of the house uh, in this distant uh, location uh, in Buenos Aires, not a terribly nice, nice location, but it, it was the advantage of it, of course, was it was very remote. So ultimately on May 11th, um, 1960, the anniversary of which was just yesterday, I believe, uh, Adolf Eichmann was uh, grabbed uh, soon after uh, he departed from the bus taking him home from work at night. Uh, he was taken in uh, by, uh, into the car, uh, driven to a safe house. Uh, this was the mask that was actually put on him uh, and he was interrogated and largely gave himself up uh, over the course of one hour, um, admitted that he was Adolf Eichmann and was really a, a kind of um, sniveling and, and compliant prisoner, uh, almost completely. So I will, I will let you all read, um, read Hunting Eichmann or the Nazi Hunters, which is the young adult version, uh, to find out more about the particulars of this. But I do want to sort of uh, highlight um, two important um, two important things, um, or two important uh, anecdotes of the course of this operation. Uh, the first one is what it was like to live and, um, and guard Adolf Eichmann over the course of the 11 days uh, that the Mossad agents uh, had him hidden in the safe house uh, before they could get him out of the country. Now, when, you, when I spoke and interviewed many of these agents, um, it was very hard to get them um, to emote, to tell you how they were feeling, uh, whether they were scared, um, what sort of thought processes were going on in their head, um, because they largely, and I say this pretty, pretty often, is that they would speak about this operation and all the dangers of it as if they were going to the dry cleaners. It was just, I went over here, uh, at this hour, we grabbed them here. Uh, we surveyed them over there. Um, it was very sort of uh, by the books, no motion. Except for when they each described what it was like to live uh, with Adolf Eichmann for 11 days. And almost to an individual, they became emotional. Um, in times, uh, their throats, um, they had trouble speaking because it was just such a an emotionally turbulent time over in the course of the operation. First, you know, it was kind of two things. First, it was pride in what they had done, uh, pride that they had uh, executed this operation uh, so successfully. They grabbed them, um, they had them in, in their power. Uh, they were about to bring them back to Israel. This was a remarkable achievement. Um, countered with this horror of living with this individual who had perpetrated uh, so many crimes against the Jewish people. This individual who they had to bathe, who they had to walk, who they had to feed, who they had to speak to. Uh, and, and Eichmann was just, as I mentioned, kind of a very sniveling, uh, compliant prisoner, not this sort of forceful, all-powerful character they, they thought that he would be. He was just this kind of miscreant uh, who's, you know, as one person said, shaking Eichmann's hand, 
uh, was like shaking a wet rag. There was just something sort of icky and uh, I didn't think I'd use the word icky today, uh, but uh, disgusting about him and having to live with him was just heart wrenching uh, for them. The other thing that I would like to talk about, and I think this sort of tethers back uh, to what I said about Sylvia and her father Lothar, uh, about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So they need to get Eichmann back to Israel. Now they can't very well um, walk him there, of course. Uh, they conceived of bringing him by boat, uh, but they thought that that would take way too much time and there was the risk that he could be stopped at any moment. So uh, Israel decides that they will fly him back. And they will do that by bringing in an Al Al plane to Argentina. Now Al Al did not have a route to Argentina, but it was the uh, Argentinian independence from Spain anniversary, I think the 400th, um, as if the Israelis cared about that. But it was the perfect cover to bring in a diplomatic um, crew uh, who would land um, in Buenos Aires, get off, and then they would bring Eichmann on board and fly him back and no one would know. What's remarkable is that you have this El Al crew um, you know, stewards, stewardesses, uh, mechanics, um, navigators who thought that they were going to Argentina on this diplomatic mission and just thought they were going to have a nice time there and then they would fly back. But what ultimately happens is the day before, the morning before they're set to leave, Issa Harrell comes into the room with them, tells them that they are actually bringing back a war criminal. Uh, they need to be very careful. Uh, each individual, um, on the Al Al uh, flight were, were scared, obviously, um, were worried about being arrested, uh, but they all did their jobs uh, and ultimately got Eichmann on the plane and were taxiing their way um, to take off when air traffic control in Argentina um, in Buenos Aires tells them to stop, that you can't take off. And there's this remarkable conversation that happens within the cockpit at this point. Uh, between Zvi Tohar, who's the pilot, and Isser Harel, who's also in the cockpit. Now, Isser Harel, who really is the kind of individual who had a backup plan for a backup plan for a backup plan. He was very meticulous in his, his operations. He was always ready uh, with another uh, plan. But in this one case, uh, getting onto the runway and being told to stop, he did not uh, anticipate. And so he just wants to take off. He tells Vito Hard to just launch out. Uh, as he said to him at the time, we will test the prowess of the Argentinian Air Force. But Z Tohar, um, who was a bit of a cool customer, uh, said we should, you know, let's hold off. Uh, let's find out what they want um, because we have very little fuel to reach uh, Dakar, Senegal. We can't be doing evasive maneuvers and cross an ocean uh, without running out of fuel. And so, uh, they decide that, that they need to figure out what's happening. And there's this individual, um, the navigator, Shaul Shaul, is probably one of my uh, favorite uh, people over the course of this story. He was this very large uh, individual. He's probably about six foot six. Um, he was in the cockpit with uh, Zvi and, and Isser. Uh, it's this huge man, and these cockpits are small now. They were even smaller back then, so he sort of shrunched in there. And he turns in his seat uh, and tells Isser Harrell that I will go. I will go find out what they want. And Isser Harrell states very clearly to Shaul that, listen, if you don't come back in the next few minutes, uh, we will take off without you uh, and you will be left holding the bag. Uh, you will be the one in trouble and we will be taking off. We can't risk the operation. And Shaul Shaul says, I will go. And he recounts walking down the steps from the airplane and feeling like <clears throat> really his heart is sinking into his shoes. He's scared. Uh, but he knew that uh, much of his family had been lost uh, during World War II uh, because of the Nazis and that this was something that he was obligated to do, uh, that bringing Eichmann to justice was important and he was willing to make that sacrifice. And that was the same sacrifice that I would venture to say that Sylvia Herman, Lothar Herman made, and that all these Mossad agents and LL agents made. They were willing to step up, 
make the sacrifice to bring Eichmann to justice, and they were successful ultimately in doing that. He was tried um, by the Israeli court. Uh, this individual here is Zeev uh, Sapir, who, who appears in Hunting Eichmann um, sort of as a bookend. Uh, at the beginning of the story um, in Hungary, uh, he was a Hungarian Jew who was sent to Auschwitz, uh, barely survived off eating uh, frozen potatoes of all things, uh, witnessed absolute horrors uh, and ultimately survived and ended up um, speaking and testifying against Eichmann uh, at the trial. Eichmann was uh, convicted. Uh, the trial, uh, he was sentenced to death. And um, more importantly than that though, uh, Eichmann was used by the Israeli government uh, to do exactly what they, David Ben-Gurion wanted, uh, to remind the world what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust and to remind Israelis why the state of Israel needed to, to exist. Uh, the trial was very important in our understanding of memory and justice. And I would argue that the reason I'm here speaking in your living rooms uh, is because of the power of, of that trial and its importance in, in extending that memory uh, of the Holocaust even to today. And I will leave that uh, there, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions um, to anyone uh, who has them. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, we have a number of questions for you. So I'll just read off a few of them. There are two that have to do with the airplane. Um, and one of them reads, what was the reason they delayed the flight on the runway? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it turns out that it was, it was just a minor um, air in, in by the El Al employees and filling out the, the flight plan. And so they didn't fill out this one little um, line and the, uh, the Argentinian, um, the Buenos Aires air traffic control wouldn't let them take the off without that. That's what Shaul, Shaul ultimately discovered, came back on the plane uh, and they got out of there. But what's critical about that is, you know, they, they planned the, the flight. This, this airplane had never flown that distance ever before. They had largely stripped the airplane of, every, of all the weight they possibly could because they wanted to make the journey from Buenos Aires to Dakar, Senegal, um, without stopping, which had never been done before. Um, and they needed to conserve every bit of fuel. And in fact, when they landed in Senegal, uh, the alarms were flashing, uh, they were running out of fuel. Um, and probably one of the best jokes over the course of the story is that one of the Mossad agents was walking up and down the aisles asking if anyone had a light, um, because he said, we need all the fuel we can get. That's great, thank you. Um, there's another question here that says, how was the important photograph taken at his home without his knowledge? So the photograph of, of Eichmann that proved so important uh, was a photograph that he had taken with his mistress uh, during the war. Uh, and she had kept the photograph, uh, I guess against um, his wishes, and had kept it in her house uh, in Germany, or at that point in 1945, 46, West Germany. Um, Simon Wiesenthal uh, and this individual named Manus Diamant. Um, Manus kind of uh, wooed her, uh, asked her out, uh, eventually went back to her apartment. Uh, while she was in the other room, uh, he went through her photograph books, uh, discovered the photograph of Eichmann, uh, and took it. Two of Lana, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, we, we got a little uh, lost there. Yep, sorry about that. Um, okay, here we go. So there's two questions that kind of go hand in hand. One is about your research and how long did it take? And the second is about how you track down the Mossad agents. Sure. So 
You know, generally my books take about two to three years. Um, generally about half of that in research and half of it writing. This, this book was really a four year process. Um, it was probably one of my longest. I spent a good amount of time in Argentina um, researching the, that sort of angle of how Eggman got there, what he did, who helped the Israelis, and the Argentinians are sort of very cagey about how they um, they keep information <laughs> away from historians like me. They 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 let you into this massive warehouse with these piles of crumbling boxes with no index whatsoever, uh, and say if you can find it, it's yours. Uh, but there's no but it would take a lifetime uh, of searching through boxes. Fortunately, I had um, some help, and we found. Uh, even the passport that Eichmann used, the Red Cross passport. The Israeli end of things was, was probably even more challenging. Um, I'm not uh, Jewish. And so there was some hesitancy uh, on the part of uh, the Israelis and particularly the Mossad uh, that for, for one reason or another that I might have some hidden agenda uh, in, in researching the story of Eichmann. So the first time I'd gotten interviews all set up uh, and, and had meetings with everybody um, through a kind of fixer. And I arrived in, in Israel, I arrived in Tel Aviv uh, for the first interview and I was told unequivocally that no one would be speaking to me um, and that I might as well go home. Uh, fortunately, I sort of kept at it and ended up meeting with uh, Rafi Aitan, who was the kind of number two uh, individual at the Mossad. Uh, met with him. He apparently liked me enough uh, to sort of open the door uh, to everybody else, uh, gave me permission to speak to them. And then uh, probably most fortunately is, and I'm not saying this for my own sort of um, abilities, but I, my timing was very good because the Israelis right when I was in Israel, decided that they would allow El Al uh, and all the employees, navigators, Shaul, Shaul, to speak uh, to me uh, and to other reporters if they wanted um, for the first time ever. And that was a real uh, coup uh, on my part. Thank you. And here's one last question. There, there's many, many questions we're getting, so I'm sorry we don't have time to get to them all. But um, here's one last one that has been asked a couple of times, and that is, what happened to the daughter and father in Argentina who broke the case and first identified the possibility of his living in Argentina? Well, we know what happened almost immediately. Um, by night, by during the trial, after he was captured um, and brought to Israel, um, word leaked out that Lothar Herman might have been involved uh, with the Israelis. Uh, he was arrested at one point, um, released. Uh, uh, feared for his life. Uh, fortunately, um, from my understanding, he got Sylvia out of the country uh, to the United States. And she is, he's, uh, Lothar Herman has, has passed away in, uh, a while ago, but Sylvia has not really, um, as far as I know, uh, come forward. I could never find her. Um, I spoke to family's members uh, of the Herman family, which is where I got a lot of the information but I never actually spoke to her, which was um, too bad. Um, but my understanding is that she's still in the United States. Uh, their role was ultimately credited uh, by uh, the Mossad uh, and they were honored for that. Uh, but I don't think anywhere near the level uh, they should have been because if there are any, there are many heroes in this story, but I would definitely put them sort of at the top of the list. Thanks, Neil. And actually, because we have a little time, I want to ask you one other question that's also come up a couple times, which is, um, what is your opinion on the film that came out? And if you could talk a little bit about its accuracy as compared to the research you've done. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's almost, you're almost always going to get the same answer from a reporter or historian who's written a book and then, and then there's a movie. It's very inaccurate. Um, and, you know, they, they take many liberties, which is okay. I understand why they do it. Um, but, you know, they, they consolidate characters. They put a lot of words into people's mouths that were never said. Uh, they, they give credit to uh, one individual like Peter Malkin more than, than others. Um, and I think uh, 
Operation Finale or Eichmann in My Hands, I think of those the two movies, uh, are definitely worth seeing. Um, but I also hope that you read uh, histories like Hunting Eichmann or Nazi Hunters or, or by other uh, historians or journalists. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing these incredible stories and all of this research that you've done. Can't wait to check out your new book. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. Um, I want to also thank our incredible team at the Holocaust Center for Humanity, um, who is working, who are all working so hard to keep our programs and resources up and running. Um, of course, our fearless leader, Executive Director Dee Simon, Nicole Bella, our Director of Development, and Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who's running the technical side of this show, Lori Warshall Cohen and Craig Verniest with our Legacy Speakers pro Program, our education team, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, and Rosa Campos, Amanda Davis, our Senior Operations and Engagement Officer, and Zaleski, Katie Lawrence, our administrator who keeps our office remote. Moving forward, to support our teachers and students and to preserve stories and teach the lessons of the Holocaust. I hope you all will join us again next Tuesday at noon for a special program with Michal Watzgar, the daughter of a Polish survivor. And thank you again, Neil. Um, I look forward to seeing you again at future programs and thank you to everyone else for joining us today. And this concludes our program. Thank, thank you. you.